Today's guest is the mayor of Minot. Join me now is Sean Sitma. Sean, a long uh, local Minot TV and business career. Now you're, heck, you're the mayor of the city, man. Let's get into a bunch of this stuff right now. Tell me a little bit about what it was like working at TV News around here. Well, TV News really had uh, a unique flavor to it. Of course, uh, got in in the late 90s and uh, really just kind of uh, got to know the community a lot more through all of my years as a journalist and uh, did uh, actually started off in sports and uh, got to know a lot of the local teams. And it was just uh, kind of a really fun part of my uh, early journalism life to, uh, to be able to essentially kind of do it all, sports news, and uh, even occasionally filled, on, filled in on weather in the early, early days. But uh, it was, yeah, it was an amazing time. I had a lot of great experiences as a journalist, everything from traveling down to Cuba, flying with the F-16s, uh, Thunderbird number 8, meeting Fidel Castro, uh, witnessing an ICBM launch down at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and uh, so many more. I mean, just the uh, unique stories that we were able to uh, tell within the community. And then, of course, the uh, train derailment and hydrous ammonia spill in 2002, and then, uh, of course, 2011 flood. Isn't it crazy how a news career can take you places no matter what market size? I mean, you're meeting Fidel Castro. I mean, I went to the Super Bowl in Minneapolis, and people think, like, shoot, what, what's big going to happen around here, you know? Yeah, and that's what I loved about this market is it really gave you so many unique opportunities. I had the opportunity uh, even to go out to the Minnesota Vikings game, and that was at the time that Jimmy Kleinsaucer was playing with the Vikes, and uh, his – old uh, high school coach had been nominated for the NFL high school coach of the year. So got to go to Carrington and uh, talk with him and then out into uh, Minneapolis after a game to speak with Jimmy. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's amazing the places that it'll take you, but I think it's also just the, the connectivity with the community. And that's really what I loved about it is just, everybody has a story. It's just, you know, what is, what is it and how impactful is it to the community? Joe Skrzeski shared us that picture of you and my sports desk in like the late 90s. That was pretty crazy to see. Um, do you know anybody that is doing the same exact thing nowadays as they were then in like local sports at all? You know, it's only a handful of people that uh, when I came up through the ranks that are still in journalism – uh, it seemed to be a common thread that uh, once people moved on, that after a few years, they, they tend to get out of broadcasting. And I don't know if that was just simply uh, what all of us know as, uh, knew as journalists or know as journalists is that, you know, it's not great money and it is so competitive. And then, uh, you know, the bigger markets, uh, it's really – I hate to say, but you, you somewhat treat it as a number, and there's always somebody, you know, that is ready and willing to uh, to step in and, and take it, take over what you've worked, you know, hard to build. So, uh, you know, I helped uh, groom a little bit Lauren Shahadi. She's out in uh, New York working for the MLB Network yet to this day. Uh, there are a couple of journal journalists that are out in Wisconsin, one in Florida. Uh, so there's a few but not many. What about like Minot area coaches and stuff? Or like, Minot I guess it's just, I guess it's just players becoming coaches nowadays, huh? Yeah, that's really, really what it is. Yeah. I, uh, didn't, uh, only got to spend a couple of years in sports. So, um, most of the coaches that uh, I knew have either retired or, or moved on. And now, yeah, some of those, uh, younger players that, you know, it's their hometown, and they're stepping up to the plate themselves to lead. You know, whether it's the junior high, the uh, the junior varsity, or you know, even the varsity ranks. So, yeah, it's that uh, old progression that is still interesting to see throughout communities around North Dakota. I probably don't know the KMOT people that you worked with from way back then, but I do know, and I saw a lot of Mike Elm, Jim Olson, and Tom Schrader. Still, what was it like working with those guys? Oh, it was great. Uh, it was kind of what I called the my glory days. Uh, you know, we had uh, a great group of veteran broadcasters who had been in the community a long time that had a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge. But they really worked hard to, you know, push everyone to be better. And you know, and I, you know, in small market journalism, we all acknowledge that most people that 
you know, work as journalists are only going to be here two or three years, but it never dissuaded anyone from really trying to grow every single person that came through the newsroom or sports division, you know, in their professional careers. And in many ways, you know, it was, it was a training ground, but we were fortunate in, in my position to where, you know, my, I, I stuck around for 15 years in Minot as journalists and then a good number of other journalists. We had Debbie Keene that had been around for, you know, 25 years. Um, Jim had been around since 86. Elm had been around since 86. Tom came in in, I want to say the mid to late 90s, uh, maybe it was early 90s, but uh, no, it was phenomenal, and we really worked together great as a team, and you know, as you probably recognize, you become a family. Uh, you hang around these guys, you work work with them for you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, and it really is an extension of your family. That's awesome, man. So when you were working on your craft in that area, did you emulate any, like, national newscasters or did you look up to folks and try to take what they do and put it into your game per se you know i did and i think that's everybody's uh learning component is you take little bits and pieces of what you truly liked or appreciated out of some of the journalists and help weave it into your style your delivery uh how it is you told a story and i remember you know even as i was trying to figure out my delivery as a as a news or sports anchor um to take little pieces but it has to be your own at the end of the day my storytelling um actually there's a guy still on cbs his name's steve hartman uh he's he's got a series called you know everybody's got a story and what i loved about his ability to tell a story was that it really drew you in and made it personal and that to me was a key success point in developing my my journalism component of telling a story is that you know if nobody cares about it why are they going to listen but more so when you're out talking with individuals and interviewing them getting them comfortable to you know basically have a conversation and that's truly where you got the most heartfelt stories and and the the true i think responses from people yes that's uh steve hartman's on the road see it every friday right before i do like the kx market research of what you guys are covering or whatever because we're rivals or whatever you can say (laughs) Uh, it's been rivals forever yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um did old uh, neil roberts teach you anything Old Neil Roberts, you know, he did did a good job of introducing me into broadcasting. I came up to Minot in 97. I'd been uh, a part-time uh, disc jockey at the local radio uh, radio station, 1340 AM down in Bowman. So I had already had four years of uh, broadcasting experience as a high school student coming into journalism. But what he did is he really opened, my, uh, opened up the doors into the television side. And uh, I actually even worked for a couple of years in radio here at Minot for 97 Kicks FM, 99.9, and uh, KCJB uh, evenings and overnights. And uh, at really seeing both industries and the directions they were heading, that was my decision then, watching how radio was really going programmed and not really not really appreciating that. So uh, Neil, Neil did a good job of... Uh, opening up those doors then to the television side and uh, pushing us as students to, you know, go out and apply for those positions at KMOT and KX. And I did apply for both, and it was KMOT that hired me originally back in 1998. All right. So back when you were a newscaster, what was it like uh, covering city government? And as you kind of have to make statements nowadays to the media, what perspective do you gain from being a media member now or then? (laughs) Yeah, in the early days, you know, the first couple of years, I found it I, to be to be flat out honest, tedious and boring. Um, you know, comparative to to you know anything that would be breaking news. Um, sitting through a lot of long long meetings and really not fully at that time uh, having an understanding of not only the current and pressing issues of Minot in the late 90s, early 2000s, but more so of the past history, and that really helped develop. Um, 
where I'm at today is, you know, seeing how my own opinion of it changed is as you start to follow it and understand it, it really does become apparent on how every single little thing that is is done at, uh, you know, whether it's city or county or even the school, that it does have an impact. And then as you learn the, pe- the back history and more so looking towards the future, um, that really gave me a full scope of understanding. And how I treat that now, especially uh, from my past history as a journalist, talking with the media is um, also understanding that not everybody that's coming to these meetings has all of that institutional knowledge. So to be um, very mindful of that (laughs) Mm -hmm. when talking about issues or, you know, giving giving interviews. So why did you want to uh, pursue city government, start with the council, then mayor, I guess, to be Board for the betterment of the community. <laughs> well, it uh, it all stems from 2011 flood. It really does. Uh, when when my home and my neighborhood was destroyed, uh, of course, we spent a significant amount of years. I mean, it took us three and a half years to finally get the house rebuilt and move back. But then uh, there. With every community that goes through a major natural disaster, you see, uh, and it is documented. There is always something that happens within um, the local government that uh, in terms of transition and that wasn't the, ri- the original intent but mine was that we were living down in a neighborhood that had uh, literally dozens of zombie homes flooded mm-hmm. homes that you know hadn't been fixed up and really was no plan for them and they were littered across the entire valley of Minot so there was more than 300 in total but it, it really bothered me that there wasn't really a plan to deal with them. That's where I launched the, uh, the neighbor, uh, Valley Neighborhood Coalition, kind of a, a citizen activist uh, mission with a whole bunch of other people that we got together at Riverside Park and talked about it. And that's that what really kind of led it. And then as things evolved from there, make Minot uh uh, became to a uh, rather emerged and I think uh, a lot of like-minded folks like me came together and uh, I don't want to say they, they recognized my ability to speak in public but they certainly uh, used uh, used that component to put me at the forefront of the uh, of the vocal and and uh, public appearance aspect of it so uh, when it came time to talk about the transition in government, it also came time for me to make the acknowledgement that it's time to put up or shut up. I had a lot of ideas that, you know, I thought would be great for the community, not only in flood recovery, but just economics and planning and future development and planning for the future. That at some point uh, it, it clicked that, you know, it, it's it's time to do more than talk, but it's time to take that step forward. And uh, when I originally, you know, decided that it wasn't about. Uh, heading towards the position of mayor, but as I became more and more involved and then uh, elected to city council not once but twice, once in the former council, uh, then in the new form, and then when former mayor Chuck Barney decided not to run, uh, I I simply asked myself, uh, who is? Who is going to step forward and uh, continue on with not only the present, but the visioning for the future and really setting things up so that we have a plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, really nobody came to the forefront immediately, and that's where I made the decision. Uh, Again, it's time to put up or shut up. How did your city council and, like, mayoral campaign platforms kind of compare given what was going on at the time and what you wanted for the community? Well, with mine, it was... um, logistically making the acknowledgement that our budget was in a rough was in rough shape because we had relied so heavily on sales tax revenues to basically uh, supplement our general spending and that works great in times of booming economy but we were heading in the other direction as oil prices were settling back and it was that not just acknowledgement that hey we've got to, we've got to make some changes and some tough decisions but uh, also willing to do an unpopular thing, and that was addressing the tax base. So moving those expenses out of sales tax back onto the property tax, but also then acknowledging what we had been experiencing, and that is 
um, outward expansion of the city limits without really identifying whether or not that that expansion would ever pay for itself. Running the numbers, it doesn't take long to figure out that, uh, you know, block by block, that the property taxes gained don't pay for the cost of services required for not only the maintenance but service of those areas. So really wanting to focus then back in on the infill and redevelopment with inside current city limits. And not to say that expansion is bad, but it has to be done fundamentally, uh, you know, fiscally responsible. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also taking a good look, hard look at our own interior for economic uh, redevelopment or economic, uh, you know, uh, basically focus on the businesses that we have and, and make sure that we have everything aligned that uh, can help them succeed. And that was, again, coming back and redesigning a lot of our um, different um, ordinances that had been changed in 12 that became business unfriendly. So um, that was just kind of base platform. Of course, flood control was an issue, but uh, when flood control was really being talked about, there was no idea of how we were going to pay for it. We knew we had to build it. We knew we had a local cost share, but putting the, the numbers down onto the spreadsheets and of course, staff and uh, our then city manager and, and finance director uh, played most of the part in this, but okay, can we afford it? And nobody really had ever answered that question uh, and we've, it was finally time to get serious about it and have that plan and how we we're going to do it. Yeah, I was going to ask. This is pulled basically from like your city bio or whatever. Um, big deal for you has been flood control, northwest area water supply, uh, resident quality of life, business climate. Since June 2018 when you took it, I mean, how far do you feel like you guys have come in those areas? I think we have made significant progress, and I'm not going to take sole credit for this, mm -hmm. and I'm not even going to take the majority of credit for it because I think we got everybody on the same same uh, same line and mission. That's including council and staff. That okay, we're, we know we're building flood control on the time, on the side of finances. Then we really got into the deep talks with the Service Basin um, or the SRJB and. Uh, then uh, really figuring out the costs in Minot, the costs outside of Minot, wrapping in those conversations with the state legislature on how we are going to long-term afford this. So um, we have gotten a, a very long way in that component. We're not all the way there yet, but I've got a strong feeling that we're going to make a big leap this legislative session to have that question answered at least for the next eight to ten years, maybe even longer. Now, when it comes to long-term financing, we have had now for the last couple of years now a five-year budget that also works with the capital improvement projects. We've seen more investment within our street infrastructure repair. We were funding at about one and a half million per year to now closer to six. And um, it's a double-edged sword. People out, you know, summertime is construction season in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot more street construction, but a big component of that is getting, getting some of our backlog of street maintenance at least on the path to being caught up. We're not going to be caught up for a long time, but at least we're starting down that path rather than letting things deteriorate. NAS, that was an entirely uh, a, a federal court issue. As luck has had it, sooner or later it had to come out of the courts. It has, and now it's back on the road to being complete and water flowing in anywhere from three to four years. Um, so, I mean, that uh, that that is a pr was a priority of mine, but by no means did I really have any hand in getting it addressed, but now that it's out of the courts, uh, it's full steam ahead to making sure that it gets done on time, on budget, and that we can meet the demands for water, not only in Minot, but North Central North Dakota. And then a lot of the other issues um, we're still working through. Uh, nothing is a quick and easy fix, but we've made markable um I think progress and taking a look at the NDR, we are on track to meet all of our deadlines. Uh, when I came in, we were not. We were not even close to being on track. Um, that's taken a little bit of uh, angst and, uh, you know, a uh, little bit of uh, heart, heartache and heartbreak for some, but um, we're there, at mm -hmm. least on track. Yeah. So when you're thinking about like government progression, obviously, like on the big stage, it makes sense to see, you know, like 
senators become vice presidents and then run for president and get it. And then locally here, I mean, like you had the experience of being a couple seats down from the mayor, gaining experience on city council. But um, tell me a little bit about like what non-council experience really helped you the most in preparing to become uh, the mayor and kind of get where people are coming from and all that good stuff, you know? And that all ties back to my days in journalism, um, really spending the better part of, oh, probably from 2002, 2003, all the way to 2013, following city council meetings. And then before that committee, you know, and also committee meetings and talking with local um, city council members, former mayors, then mayors at the time, of course, but really just following um, what was happening understanding it, asking questions when I, you know, when, when you didn't know or didn't have an idea of what was going on, uh, but really just being engaged. And it was my job to be engaged, but it really gave me a, a, a really big head start in understanding. But another component of that too, as a journalist, I'd spent uh, probably the better part of eight years kind of doing a, a lot of research on the past history of mine. And I was always fascinated with how things had evolved, not only over the last five or 10 years to me prior, uh, prior to be becoming a journalist, but all the way back into the early days of Minot. I've got a <laughs> file now at my house uh, that I had compiled that is just enormous, dating back to, you know, the early days of Minot and then progressing forward. But I always say you, you, you can't move forward without having an understanding of where you came from. And I think that applies very much uh, to this day in the community. And then also understanding how Minot plays uh, a very important component to North Central North Dakota and to the state, and also how uh, we interact and uh, very much play a very important part with the DOD, Minot Air Force Base. Uh, that is a huge component, and what we do at City Hall very much does have an impact uh, with the with the great men and women out at Monad Air Force Base. So, I I tell anybody that you don't have to be a journalist; you just have to pay attention and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a I don't know if your file is like this at your house, but like growing up, my dad was always really prideful of my hometown. He would always have like a bunch of throwback like Gap, Pennsylvania collectibles and stuff put everywhere. <laughs> so it was really cool. So, um, what have been the, the toughest and maybe the easier choices to make as a mayor, like there's even anything easy for you to decide? Oh, you know, it, there's there's nothing easy. The mm -hmm. world went and evolved with social media. Um, the the Some of the toughest decisions can be easy if you really gather all of the pertinent information, weigh out all of, and I mean all of the scenarios that are there, it might be an unpopular decision, but it's the right decision to make. And I'll put, uh, you know, even for some, it's not exactly popular that we're moving City Hall, even though that it's mostly uh, the, <laughs> substantially being paid for with grant dollars. Um, as folks have said, it's, it's not the right time. And I can tell you it doesn't matter what time what day, what year, it's never the right time to do something like that. However, given all of the options, again, uh, it makes the absolute most sense considering that our police department needs space. Uh, we're, we're making a big focus on our downtown, revitalizing and, uh, and that. So that's, while it may be a difficult decision, um, it's, it's one that I didn't find difficult simply because um, using all of the pertinent information and keeping emotion off the table, um, that's, that's probably uh, one of the easier, even though um, very con contemplative for many people. Uh, hard decisions, th there's hard decisions every day. Throw the pandemic right in the middle of this. You know, the mask mandate, um, trying to weave our way through the economic turmoil, trying to work with all of our partners from the state and federal level and, and, and to come up with some sort of solutions uh, with our limited capabilities in, in true scope, limited capabilities. Um, there, there isn't an easy answer, and I tell you what, there isn't a right answer given all of the circumstances uh, with what's going on with COVID. But I, I'd like to think that um, we're doing well. We're on the right track right now, um, but we're not out of the woods yet. Mm -hmm. And then 
shoot, you can throw just about any other decision on there, whether it's landfill uh, as being a difficult decision to make. That one comes down to finance, money, and availability. Uh, it's a, the decision that was made was the right decision. Um, some may not see it that way. Uh, and then you can get into a whole uh, – we could, we could talk for about five, six hours on, on just this issue, uh, this area alone. Yeah, I feel that, man, exactly. I was curious. You said, like, you even brought up yourself, like uh... – you know, there's opposition to things that you guys have to pick to decide on. How do you um, deal with, like, criticism and opposition, man? You know, like, sometimes you have people come to the council meetings, and whether they're really informed or not informed at all, I mean, they still have a right to, like, say to you guys' faces how they, they hate what's going on, or, like, you know, people will go on social media and complain about government and all that stuff. Uh, just how how do you take that stuff into account, and how do you avoid, like, I don't know, like, feeling bad about anything? I mean, where's your kind of mental state with that? It's tough. It's tough not to take things personally. I try not to go through the forums. And as a matter of fact, I rarely go through any of the threads on social media simply because um, that, that is the Couch Critics' uh, base area for making uninformed comments. Uh, it, it is very easy to jump to substantial conclusions without having any information and then having, you know, 50 people back you up on it. Uh, I, I basically, when I get into my decision-making, uh, mode is you, you put your emotions aside and you, you take in as much information as you can and that, you know, whether that's just raw data input from people and then you also have to weigh all of that against each other and you cannot and I, I, I keep coming back to it but you can't let your emotions you know kind of cloud over your judgment I very kind of systematically go through that you know when we had that really uh, tense long city council meeting with the rainbow flag there were a lot of very angry, even though some said they weren't. Well, um, I'll say it for what it is. Very angry individuals that were making direct attacks uh, on me and towards the council. And I made a point to bring that all back on to me because it was my decision um, with the process that was in place. But, you know, it's it, that is a part of government. You're going to have to make unpopular decisions. And you're also going to have to stand before and take the heat from it regardless of whether someone thinks it's right or wrong or whether somebody has their base of their decision on fact, on religion, or just on raw emotion. So um, it, it's part of the job. It's not an easy part of the job. But there again, at the end of the day, uh, you, you really just have to keep in mind on what you're doing, or at least I do, is that it's the greater good. It's the betterment of the community. And if it's identifying something that, you know, is a problem in our community, whether it's discrimination or something else, you, you got to try to do what's right for the community and not necessarily for you or for, you know, uh, maybe a group of people. Is there anything else you'd like folks to know when it comes to just the vein of something that's underrated or perhaps a misconception besides, you know, that point of view with my city government? You know, I think one thing that people have to remember is that uh, all of our positions in elected positions yeah. are part time. Uh, we, we, we do stick full-time hours into this uh, in many, many circumstances. I will say uh, I came into the position of mayor knowing that it was going to be a heavy lift and a lot of, uh, a lot of time given to this, but I even underestimated that. But there again, who would have seen uh, a pandemic? Who would have seen um, some of the issues that, that have arisen? So people at least should have that base understanding is that um, – it's long hours, it's low pay, but we're doing it for the betterment of the community and not, you know, on some personal vendetta uh, or, or, or I, I guess, even political agenda. There's a reason that we're nonpartisan, uh, and, I, and I hold true to that. Um, and the other point is, uh, especially on social media, the, the hardest part for folks to understand is typically we are tr we are trying to make our decisions with 
a vast amount of information and data that is given to us. And generally, most people on social media don't take even a fraction of the time to go through all of the information, to get all of the data, even though it is available out there. And that's how we try to base our decisions. Um, and, and so people that, are, people that are really railing on an issue, we tend to find if we have one-on-one -on -one conversations and are able to feed that data, you know, they may not always agree, but at least now they understand. And for other folks, if you if you really do want to get an understanding of the issue or share your opinion, write us an email, give us a call. Uh, I, I try to answer my phone as much as humanly possible as a part-time position. Um, but uh, I find that most of the time, at least, uh, we're able to have civil conversations back and forth and uh, just gen genuinely share information. And at the end of that conversation, again, they may not may not agree, but at least they now understand where I'm coming from or some of the other elected officials are coming from. Got it. So uh, on the lighter side of things, how does uh, the roast of Sean Sitma come about and <laughs> – how on earth does this happen? I mean, only in my not where like the mayor's like, sure, I'll get roasted after all this talk about dealing with people not liking certain things or whatever. Right. Yeah. And then even help build the stage to boot. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that came out of I, I, you know, we we've had a lot of a uh, lot of I think tense years in Minot, following the flood, following the economic boom, following uh, you know the economic. Um, retraction uh, following the, the oil retraction. And one thing that has just genuinely bothered me, not as the mayor, but just as an individual, that, you know, everybody is trying to take things so dang serious and that if you're, if you don't agree with, you know, my opinion, then you're the, you know, you're the enemy politically. And that, that bothers me because I think that's what we see on the national politics side. And when um, Jonah Lantau and Jake Threlkill approached me about it, I said, you know, it's it's time to have a little bit of fun with uh, with politics, at least locally. And you know, I, I made the comment uh, as I was getting ro after I got roasted as kind of a rebuttal to one of them. I said, did you guys do any writing whatsoever? Did you just go right onto the Facebook feed and uh, take off the thread? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it, it was just something that Spoken also heart, yeah. I wanted people to understand, you know, I'm, I'm just as, as human as the next person. And if you can't poke a little fun at yourself, you're taking the job too serious. Who really uh, nailed you on that roast night, man? And then who else? Didn't, <laughs> who, who bombed and who killed there? <laughs> I think they did a really good job. What they uh, <laughs> what they struggled on was I think I think they really had this idea that they were going to call around and get a bunch of juicy stories on me. And the irony is, I'm boring. I really am. Uh, <laughs> I grew up uh, from the time I was 19 years old, working full time as a journalist. So I. You know, talk to just about anybody in town. That there, there isn't much dirt to dig on me, only because I, I've spent so much time in my life, kind of in the public eye. Uh, but no, they did a really good job of, I think, having some fun with the issues. Uh, you know, of course, uh, the old parking ramps came to light a couple of times, but mm -hmm. uh, they, they took some good shots in the, uh, I, I think, in the entire fun of the uh, idea of a roast. And uh, I'll give them credit; they came up with some really good singers. Uh, I think uh, Jonah had compared me to uh, the villain in Die Hard falling off of uh, uh, the tower at the end. And <laughs> I didn't see that one coming even from left field. So they did a good job. Uh, very talented. And the other part is that I, you know, we've got a great arts and culture community in our town. And for something like this, a talk show, a late night talk show, uh, I, I I really thought it would it'd be something that um, W would be helped by having uh, the mayor participate in his own dang roast with this late night program. Yeah, because um, that's a great view. This I have the, the parking garage is right outside my apartment. Man, it looks great. <laughs> Who is the um, who's the funniest member on the city council? 
the funniest person on city council. I, yeah. I'm going to go to you know I'm going to go to Paul Pittner on this one. His mm. stories uh, when he gets talking about his wife uh, and family, uh, he <laughs> does a good job of being campy uh, with some of his stories to make his point. Uh, <laughs> we don't uh, don't have normally a lot of uh, time or. or uh, opportunity for levity or humor, but uh, uh, Alderman Pittner does a good job of utilizing his his family to uh, help make the point. I also want to credit Tom Ross now that he's back on it, especially like if he's in like hour three at the uh, Beaver Nation, you know. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. Uh, we we haven't really gotten to too many opportunities yet to to uh, get the the humor side of that, but uh, there's still plenty of time. <laughs> All right, yeah, I guess I don't know how much people can hang out anymore in my not government positions. Uh, has anything really surprised you during your time as the mayor besides the jokes about Die Hard? Wow. Uh, some things have surprised me. Um, some of the – just the uh, – it, it's almost tough to put into words, but – the entrenchment, and I'll dial it over to social media, uh, it doesn't matter what you're going to do, it's always going to be wrong. Even if it was something that they thought was right six months ago. I, you know, I, I try to hold on to the hope and idea that most people are, are reasonable and sensible, um, but there are some people that just don't care. They're on the social media to rail. So that's the part that I guess is surprising, not surprising. Um, it was it, it was very difficult to go through the process uh, with the uh, city manager firing. I was not, of course, anticipating having to deal with anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it's all part of the growth process. Um, you know, in, in any, you know, city government or business, um, there's always going to be challenges. And those challenges certainly are not always going to be known. And you just have to rise up and keep pushing forward. Yeah. So like you guys, you guys all want to get into city government to try to help the community and stuff. Every time that you at least uh, like the attention a little bit, like you're the guys that are talking about these issues. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have run if I wouldn't have run if I didn't uh, didn't think that I, I should be a, the, the leading voice on the issues. There we go. Um, I <laughs> I do enjoy going down to Bismarck and testifying in front of the legislature as the voice for Minot. Uh, I, I, you know, not not to have too much of an inflated ego, but I think I do a very good job of conveying our needs and what our mission is, and uh, ha making those uh, developing those relationships with a lot of the different legislators from around the state of North Dakota. Uh, one other thing I truly enjoy, and that is uh, my collective relationship with Monad Air Force Base. Uh, I'm an honorary commander to the 5th Bomb Wing, Colonel Michael Walter. Uh, we stay in communication on a very regular basis. Of course, that uh, has even been um, amplified even more since COVID. But uh, the, the relationship between Monet and Monet Air Force Base is something exceptional. And I've made a point to even further try to grow that relationship and show not only the Department of Defense when I set, got a – uh, an opportunity to sit down with the secretary of the Air Force um, for 45 minutes to to really show and show off the best of Minot and acknowledge our challenges. That's why she was here. And uh, that is actually one of my, my more uh, favorite pasts that, that I have as mayor is growing that relationship and looking for new ways um, to help that relationship benefit both Minot Air Force Base and the community of Minot. So you can include the times that you were just on city council and not even the mayor in this one. What's the record for the shortest city council meeting ever? Oh, it was probably uh, three or four minutes by the time you actually got through roll call. The... Uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and we, you know, we've had some special meetings where we literally just had to show up and vote to pass something because of state century code. Mm -hmm. Pass it, we're done. So three or four minutes by far is the shortest. Um, we haven't had too many of those. Right, yeah, <laughs> I, I can imagine in this climate nowadays, for sure. Most of them anymore last anywhere from two to five hours. Yeah, yeah, that, that's about right. So, like, just the roll call and the Pledge of Allegiance takes the balance of, like, the very short ones. 
Yeah. That's something. Um, it, it, it might be a few far and in between anymore on those, though. All right, so I'll give you the easy open one, to, open-ended question to wrap up the political talk here. I mean, what's up? What's the plan moving forward, Mayor Sitma? What's up and what's the plan moving forward? Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of deadlines coming up that actually coincide with the end of uh, my term, which is June 2022. Uh, National Disaster Resiliency, uh, we have to have that closed out by September 30th, 2022. That is uh, a lot of projects that have to be put to bed and uh, closed out by that time. That is uh, City Hall. That is um, the Zombie Home Initiative. That is going to be um, the uh, the CTE, Career and Technical Education Center. Uh, that is the homeless shelter. Uh, and the list goes on. We ha- have low to moderate income housing projects that have to be wrapped by that date. Uh, I don't expect City Hall to be done by that date. Simply the money from that grant has to be wrapped by that date. Mm-hmm. Flood control has to be well onto its way for completion for the first major benchmark. That stage is one through five. Uh, it's not going to be complete by then simply because uh, we are relying on the federal government to still uh, appropriate some funds. But uh, I think we're going to be well on our way to being to that first major benchmark. That's flood protection for 65% of the community. Uh, I take a look at our budget. We are going to continue to have a five-year budgeting schedule, and I hope to have a 10-year by the time that this term is up so that we can even start strategically planning farther out. And speaking of strategically planning, we have to have a strategic plan in in and on the books by 2022 or by mid-2022. Our community has never actually put one together as a city. We have to get this done so that we can start lining up our budget priorities with our planning for the community. And uh, that's not a quick or easy project. That's normally an 18-month project. Uh, I'd like to shorten that up. We've got a new city manager coming in, and that is going to be a high priority to start kickstarting that process in place. And then quality of life. You know, we've got a ton of things that are going on. I mean, you take a look around uh, Minot, uh, the, the city of Minot, and I'm talking city hall with the employees and the elected, we played a big part in helping uh, push a lot of these the uh, Discovery Center is is one of those components. That should be opened and rolling uh, by the time the 2022 rolls around. And then uh, the uh, the bubble. I'm hoping to see more develop out of the MSU bubble that uh, some tax that a million dollars of tax dollars went into uh, to uh, help really grow and uh, inspire some more activities there. Working with Visit Minot, I expect to see a lot more um, events brought into the city, and this is collectively collaborating with our community partners. That is going to continue to grow and is going to further develop by the time that rolls on. Anything beyond that, I'm not committing at this time. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, there you go. I was going to say, my takeaway after hearing all that, so we're just confirming that the old city hall building is going to be used for something good for the community, and it's not just going to turn into, like, Delta House. No, as a matter of fact, no. uh, the, the police department is and has been out of space for years. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be and is in dire need uh, for more space. So when City Hall moves downtown, the police department is going to take over the majority of what is City Hall now. Municipal court is going to come back into where the council chambers are, freeing up the space over the auditorium so we can get major events back into the auditorium. They're they're somewhat hamstrung right now for space. They've essentially got the courts in a couple of uh, meeting rooms. That's it. Mm-hmm. And then we take IT out of uh, the auditorium and move that over to the new city hall, and you have a fully capa- full capacity at the Monument Municipal Auditorium for bigger events. That is that is a, a major, uh, another major reason why it's important to get the, that city hall process moving forward. I got to tell you, Sean, I'm a little disappointed to hear that you're just planning this uh, 10-year plan. You can't tell me what Minot's going to look like in the year 2100. <laughs> well, 
we got to start. Uh, you got to walk before you uh, before you run, right? Yeah. And right now we're 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 crawling, and uh, uh, I think we're crawling from a standstill not too long ago. So I'm at least, uh, uh, and if not, I think we're up off at least one knee. So I think uh, we're, we're making good headway. It's a matter of getting all of the right players in the right positions. Just like in sports, you want to have your key players in the right position in that, in this component, that's our community partners and a plan in place collectively for the community, a game plan. And that's how you win games. I knew you were looking for the sports portion of this after all this time, the office rivalry, who's the better golfer between you and Josh wrestler. <laughs> Here is the irony. I don't golf. No, I don't golf. I am one of the uh, few insurance agents or yeah. politicians that doesn't golf. I played baseball my entire younger career, and I played softball my entire adult career. And golf swings and softball swings or baseball swings really are not compatible. So uh, I have never really picked up the sport. How have you so been the able... answer is Josh. Yeah. <laughs> How have you been able to successfully glad hand without playing golf? Well, uh, when you're so busy with meetings and everything <laughs> else like that, you don't have time. Uh, maybe, maybe someday down the road, a future mayor, when a lot more things get, uh, I think, moving with momentum, uh, there would be more time for that. But uh, I, I use the time that I would be doing things like that uh, to really meet with people and um, further other relationships that you know may not have had as much attention in the past. And I'll point to mine at the Air Force Base and to uh, some of the other community partners with that. So I just spend a lot more time um, doing other things and uh, leave the golfing uh, to, the, to, to the other folks. Oh, I could just picture it now, just like people complain about Trump golfing too much in office and then like, Mayor Sitma at the country club too much or something like that. So I, I guess that makes sense for you to like not not pick up the sport. That's fantastic. So uh, I wanted to get you out on this, Sean. Uh, uh, one more expertise I wanted to ask you about when you were down maybe in Cuba. Did Fidel Castro slip you any good cigars or what do you got Absolutely rolling there? Did. Absolutely he did. That was actually one of the weird stories about Cuba. So we were in this dinner meeting where we didn't even expect uh, Fidel Castro to show up. I was with uh, North Dakota Agriculture Commissioner Roger Johnson and some other North Dakota dignitaries uh, at the time, and uh, we were supposed to be meeting just with the trade uh, trade um, director down there uh, and in walks Fidel. So we had this four or five hour meeting that had I don't know how many courses in it and of course at the end of the meeting there was myself and two other journalists there one was a reporter from the Fargo Forum the other one was a radio guy from um, Devil's Lake I believe so at the end they come around just like in the 1950s with this huge tray of cigars and everyone had to pick a cigar and they brought over an after dinner drink so we go through and smoke and have our after dinner drink and then Fidel stands up and starts one by one going around the table table of about 25 people and and that includes us talking with him for about 5 minutes and then hands them a box of Cuban Cohibas his private brand and they get about halfway through, and the journalist from the Fargo Forum, and I don't even remember his name, looks at me and goes, you know, we can't take that. That's payola. That, that's, you know, uh, morally wrong uh, in, our, in our business world. And I looked at him, and I was young at that time, but I think at least aware enough to, uh, you know, have a, have a big picture of reality. And I looked at him, I said, you know what, Fidel – had just executed nine dissident journalists a month prior for writing unfavorable stories about him in Cuba. Take the damn cigars and give them away, whatever you're going to do, but don't <laughs> disrespect the president in his own hotel in his own country. So, oh, yeah. yes, I got to speak with him for five minutes, got my box of cigars, and a uh, little-known fact that if you are able to go down to Cuba under current, uh, at that time, even current um, uh, embargo that you could still bring back cigars and rum from Cuba at, as long as it wasn't more than $100 worth. So, yeah, I, I ended up getting some really good cigars out of it. Yeah, there's a, there's a platform for you for the early 2020s. Just get a little pipeline coming up to Minot. <laughs> well, 
knowing what I know about cigars, I can tell you that the uh, the industry has evolved, and there's a lot better cigars than uh, than those of the Cohiba now. So oh I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> now we'll never see you again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, uh, uh, Sean, this has been awesome, man. Really appreciate you taking out the time. And uh, hey, man, keep doing your best, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's you. At, at the end of the day, you got to keep your head up. You cannot allow yourself to get bogged down. You cannot allow yourself to get beat down. And uh, keep your eye on the ball because that's really what it is. You know that we're here to do, and whether you know that's at work or at home or as an elected official, right? Mm-hmm. You just got to keep moving forward. All right, awesome, man. Till till next time, uh, Mayor Sitma. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ben. Take care.